The Quiet Warrior Show, where we help top leaders find their pathway to incredible success and a lifetime of happiness. Here is your host, Tom Dutta, The Quiet Warrior. Well, here we are. Welcome, everybody, to The Quiet Warrior Show. Today, we're live streaming across Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And you can find the productions of this episode we're taping today will be released on The Quiet Warrior Podcast and as a YouTube premiere sometime in the near future. Everybody, I'm excited today to have a guest. And you can see him there if you're watching this live stream, Dr. Thomas Jordan. We've been having some fun before going live here. He's given me permission to call him Tom. <laughs> I'm interviewing another Tom. That's a first. I want to tell you a bit about the greatness behind Dr. Jordan, everybody. He's helped thousands of individuals and couples enjoy more fulfilling relationships, experiencing more satisfying, longer lasting love lives as a psychotherapist. He's done that for 33 years. Uh, he's the author of a breakthrough book and in the stock ticker on the screen, he'll tell you it's called Learning to Love, Guide to Healing Your Disappointing love life. There's much we're going to learn today. So Dr. Jordan, or I'll call you Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me, Tom. Uh, it's been a, it's been fun, and I want to just tell the audience that I celebrated my, celebrated my 25th wedding anniversary, uh, January the 20th, and as I sat in a, a lounge with my wife, we were playing cards, and I read your book, and I'll tell you, man, uh, talking to a guy who's had a train wreck of relationships in his life, I can be all open about that. Uh, my knowledge grew to a level, and I thought, I can't wait to interview you. So let's start with you. I'm going to put you on the spot. I know you have a good sense of humor like I do, I hope. <laughs> Tell us one thing one thing about yourself, Tom, that you think a lot of people don't know. Um, that I changed my own love life as a consequence of uh, learning a few things about love relationships. Uh, I learned in my personal therapy experience uh, back in the 90s that I was importing a lot of uh, – what my mother had taught me that was unfortunately unhealthy in my love life. So I was repeating that over and over again, made some changes, tried to dissect what the steps are in doing that. And that became one of the reasons why I wrote the book, because I believe that people could become a little more conscious of their love lives as a consequence of reading something that was easy, easy to read and pretty direct. And uh, that was one of the reasons I wrote it. Absolutely. Hey, listen, why don't you do a quick commercial? We'll talk about the book a lot today. Hold it up there. Let us take a look at that uh, okay. cover. Oh, there it is. <laughs> and then we All see right, it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Learning to love. So those who will listen to the podcast, obviously you can't see it, but you can certainly go online and find that book. I highly recommend uh, people uh, do buy it. And you know what? Authors need to be known for their work. Let's give it a review posted on Amazon or uh, perhaps goodreads.com where many authors hang out. But I want to get back to what you said, because when I when I do my interviews, my head goes on a journey. This is called the hero's journey. And you said something interesting to me about your relationships or what you saw when you were younger that was passed on to you. Tell us a bit about that. Where were you born and a little bit about your mom and dad before we go further? Uh -huh. I, I was born in New Bedford, Massachusetts, and uh, I'm Portuguese by heritage. Uh, my parents were born in America, first generation in America, and uh, my grandparents lived upstairs, parents downstairs, myself, my three brothers, and uh, uh, they owned a, a, a grocery store, ethnic grocery store, and it was a kind of quiet little suburban community I grew up in. Um, my uh, my mother was uh, a little bit unhappy in the course of her life, and guess which son sat at the dining dining room table listening to her unhappiness? That was that would be me. Um, and uh, from that uh, experience. I learned the certain things about love relationships that uh, I brought into my love life. So um, I learned yeah. that uh, women, eligible women, are controlling and dependent. And uh, whether they were or were not in the course of my love life, I expected they would be. And as a consequence, had a number of uh, repeating love life disappointments. So um, I was able to, in my personal therapy experience, uh, understand that that was a problem. And uh, I stopped uh, using what I had learned as the template to formulate and put together my own love life and began to challenge what I had learned. So I was able to revise that, understand that independence and not being controlling was a better blueprint to use in my 
love life. And eventually I found my wife. Uh, she found me. And uh, we've been married for 27 years. Well, so, well, first of all, congratulations on the 27. I mean, you're two you. up on me, so I will be catching up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a shout out to your, a shout out to Victoria from Anna and I. Uh, that's a milestone. Uh, so when I, I want to tell you something that uh, I thought about here when you were talking that I learned that in the first, you know, 10, 15 years, maybe even up to 20, the, the part of the rational part of the brain isn't developed enough for children to understand the difference between truth or, or, or untruth. And everything mm -hmm. I saw in my home, my dad was, you know, command and control, a uh, military man, a uh, violent uh, dude when he was drunk, uh, toward yeah. the family part. And I took the brunt of that. But I think one of the things you said, which is a teaching moment, Tom, is words matter. And, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes my parents would be arguing or talking about their unhappiness and didn't seem to really understand that everything they say really registers in my subconscious uh, as thoughts and emotions. Uh -huh. So I want to ask you this about love. How do you define love? Um, define love. Love is an unpredictable, uncontrollable, wonderful emotion that uh, you can't control, so it emerges on its own. It happens to us. Maybe it's one of the last experiences we can't control as human beings, so that's important, and it's mysterious. Um, but, you know, in my book, I, I right at the beginning, I say this is not a book about love. This is a book about love relationships, the kind of relationships we set up when we fall in love. Um, that we can do something about. Love, well, love comes and goes. Hopefully it stays when you have a, uh, when you set up a, a nurturing um, relationship to contain it, to feed it, to make it grow. Um, so that, that's my focus, is uh, the type of relationships we set up when we fall in love. And the word in, love, the little word in is kind of interesting as well. Um, you yeah, know, that's people amazing. sometimes say, I love him or her, but I'm in love with him or her. <laughs> in love. Uh, it's like being in something with somebody. And yeah. it's kind of specialized as one person in that bubble. I'm in uh, love with so and so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, now you're getting me excited. I, when I read the book, and by the way, everybody, there it is, proof. And there's a bunch of highlights <laughs> all throughout this book. Again, going back to my uh, 25th anniversary retreat, I'm in the lounge reading this book. Anna and I are playing a card game, and we pulled one card. And it was one of those games where you pull it. One person answers it, the other one doesn't. Man, uh -huh. I learned so I learned so much about her after 25 years, Tom, because we actually we actually talked. And and the thing is, one of the questions led us down a, a route a, a road that wasn't very positive. And I just realized that man, this is still work. Uh, I'm going to read the back of your book here for a moment before I I put something out to you. It says, in, in most instances, repetitive love life experience is replicating some kind of past relationship experience. Seeing the connections between your past relationship experience and what is happening in your present love life empowers you to make the needed changes in your love life. Remember, all of this is learned so it can be unlearned and something healthier learned or relearned putting you in control of your love life. Now, this this blew my mind, and so I'm going to use me now, if you'll let me, as a guinea pig for the rest of the show. Uh, I, I honestly, I'm putting myself out very vulnerably, but my wife and my tribe know that that's Tommy. <laughs> that's who he is. So here, here's some things I read in your book, and I, so number one is in my early years, my father left home at an early age. He had multiple affairs, and he was gone when I was 12. So I became the man of the house. I also, it was my, I love my parents. They didn't know better. They were in strife, but I took the brunt of, let's just say, physical and the mental uh, trauma from them. I I left and I went out in the real world and fast-tracked up the corporate ladder. And in my TED Talk, I talk about being a, a self-worth chaser, not a, you know, a success chaser when I figured that out, trying to search for something I was missing. But I became successful. But in the business world, I started trying to apply what I learned in communication relationships to teams, and I, I fell down. And the last thing I'll give you is I, my first marriage. I went into it, and I think I went into it not understanding what love was, but trying to fix a bad situation that the woman I met was in, and I couldn't pull out of it for some seven years until I finally realized it wasn't healthy. Turn the clock forward. My second marriage, I'm 25 years, something changed, something's different. But throughout my marriage, 
My wife and I, we we call our relationship blood, sweat, and tears. It's actually part of our personality types. Uh, we love each other dearly, but you know, she'll say you're controlling, and I'll say you're controlling. And I, after reading your book, based on the things I saw about abandonment and uh, uh, parental situations that I experienced, talk to me about me and what what comes to mind with that in terms yeah. of of this story. Yeah. Uh, number one, thank you for putting your vulnerability out there. Um, you're a brave man. Um, and uh, I just you. remind you that vulnerability and love are very much related. They hang around <laughs> together. Um, in order to be in love, uh, being open, which is another word for vulnerable, is very important. Um, so um, first thing I would, I would think about is what your father taught you about love relationships. And um, that might seem a little odd because you'd hope he didn't teach you much, much because he didn't know much, as you indicated. Right. But the way he related to people in the family can be unconscious lessons about love relationships, because our love life starts at the moment we're born. Wow. In fact, I would define love life as any and all relationships ha involving the emotion of love, past and present. So love life Starts from the beginning of life all the way to the end. So love life lesson, lessons can begin right from the beginning of life. How your father related to you and to other members of the family, including and most especially your mother, these are lessons we can learn unconsciously. Um, of course, we can, we can consciously say to ourselves, I'm not going to be like my father, and I'm going to do something different. And that's important, yeah. and that's good. But... There's also unconscious aspects to what we can learn because these experiences, we don't know we're learning. We don't know what we're learning when we're young. We're being exposed to an interpersonal situation where things are happening and those things can get into the subconscious brain, as you indicated. Um, yep. So he would be one person I would be interested in understanding what impact he had on you and to take a look and see if anything has lingered into your life going forward. And lingering can occur in different ways. You know, we can reenact the unhealthy things we've learned, or we can expect to receive them from the people we find. So it can go either way if you follow me. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and that resonates. My father, uh, I honored dad actually by talking about him. He passed away in 2018 unexpectedly from a heart attack. But my dad was 22 years dry. He was on with AA. Uh, he became uh -huh. a great man. He did a lot of things in his community and he became a hero. And it, what I learned, and I'll just give this up to you to comment on if in the context of this, me as the uh, patient, uh, my dad, I learned, grew up in Fiji, the Fiji Islands. He was a uh -huh. son of in Indian parents. He was pushed off a bridge. That's how he learned to swim. His father was oh. a chronic alcoholic and passed away oh. when he was young. Mm. And then dad got it. Dad was in the Mormon, believe it or not. I didn't smoke, drink. And then when he met my mother, my mom said, "That's he's like my little Elvis. He was this good looking guy. No drink, no mm. smoke. Get in the army and boom, everything changed. The power of command and control they teach, but he became a pretty bad drinker. But mm -hmm. What I learned is I met with him and made peace before he passed a few months. And uh, I said, tell me about your your dad. Tell me about your growing up. And uh, what I learned, uh, Tom, is that he he passed on things to me, but I never knew his story, that the things uh -huh. he went through, his blueprint yeah. was. So maybe you can just talk about, about that, anything you want to say. Well, I, I think that the fact that you're asking questions about it is great. Um, you know, we middle-aged men, um, I'm a little further along than that, but we middle-aged <laughs> men, um, uh, middle age is a wonderful time to begin asking questions, you know, and uh, approaching people, our elders, and to get their story, it, it adds to our fund of information about, you know, life and what patterns might exist in our own life. So that consciousness, that interest in getting his story is very important because it puts in your hands the possibility of uh, uh, picking and choosing, you know, what have I learned from this significant figure and what's healthy and what isn't? And let me see if I can unlearn what was unhealthy. And I think when a person dedicates a certain amount of consciousness to doing that, they get control over their love life, you know, their emotional yep. life to a bigger extent. And that's important to make change 
consciousness is always the first step. So interviewing our parents is a wonderful uh, example of that. Of course, some parents might participate in that interview and others may not. I mean, I tried interviewing my mother about some of the uh, child control (laughs) tactics she used when I was a child, and she unfortunately could not get into it. She left the room and went somewhere else. (laughs) Like, wait (laughs) a minute. (laughs) I'm talking about you and my analysis. I want the truth. Okay, but I didn't. I I gave her a pass. Okay. (laughs) Absolutely. I didn't pound on the door. Okay. I, 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 I honor you for that. Everybody, this is a teaching moment that, and what you're hearing here is sometimes maybe the understanding of your parents' uh, relationship may, may help, but then again, sometimes you, they're not able to speak to you about that, so you need to just accept that. I want to just say this about, uh, a lot of times I meet people that say, you know, they, they try to cover up. Maybe it's just they're not prepared to be vulnerable. Sometimes, uh, Tom, they'll say that, privately to me, they're afraid to what their parents will think, but they won't acknowledge that there were issues in their the relationship that yes. their parents, they'll see yes. it, but they'll cover it up and, and tell a story that's a fantasy. Uh, just comment on that for a moment. Yeah. You know, defenses are a very important way that we cope with, cope with uh, unhealthy things that we may have experienced in life and the unhealthy learning we we derived from it. So defenses are very important. But you named another one that I want to add to the list, and that is trying to change partners. Uh, yeah. uh, you mentioned that in your first marriage, uh, changing your wife was a part of what you tried to accomplish. I find that uh, with people I work with, that can cause a lot of misery. I mean, I like to think that when you try to change a partner, you get the two R's, and that's not rest and relaxation. It's resistance and resentment. <laughs> that's uh, right. <laughs> so, uh, and, and you know, I haven't met, I've been in practice for a long time, but never met anyone who successfully changed somebody. I'm still waiting. <laughs> I worked on my own mother for years. <laughs> she was my first uh, uh, unsuccessful case, right? Um, no, it, it, it doesn't work that way. People have to be motivated to, to change. This is what I've found. But uh, uh, defensiveness, you know, the idea that if you open that door, you're going to feel uncomfortable, you're going to feel vulnerable, or you're going to feel some unresolved hurt. That's a big hurdle to working on the love life, for example, you know. And um, there are a million different types of ways people protect themselves from uh, the discomforts that you can have. But you get rewarded for opening that door. You you get rewarded for looking inside to work on your love life. The reward is learning something different that produces a a more successful love life. And I want to add something that's important, Tom. Uh, In the book, I talk about the psychological love life, as you remember, and that's a very important concept. Um, uh, What I'd like to teach people is that uh, if you want to make permanent changes in your love life, right, healthy permanent changes in your love life, you do that on the inside of yourself first. And so the idea of a psychological love life means trying to find out what the patterns are that you bring with you into your love relationships. That's your psychological love life. It consists of the relationship experiences you've had in life that have taught you about love relationships, healthy or unhealthy. Uh, It also consists of what we've learned from those love relationships, our beliefs and the behaviors that we um, that we that occur when we're in a love relationship, and it also contains some of the ways we protect ourselves from uh, learning what's what's happened in our love lives or uh, what we've learned in our love life. So that's your psychological love life. Um, to change your psychological love life is a very powerful way of making permanent changes in what goes on in love relationships. So in the book, I talk about a three-step method of uh, trying to find out what is in your psychological love life so that you can steer it in a healthier and different direction by unlearning things that are uh, unhealthy that you've learned in the course of your life. So the psychological love life is a very important internal blueprint template um, for what occurs in our love relationships repetitively, because sometimes these patterns repeat. Um, 
Now, that's fascinating. Everybody, if you've just joined us, we're live streaming here. This will be produced in the future as a podcast and a YouTube premiere with uh, Dr. Thomas Jordan. Uh, we're calling each other Tom today. <laughs> and the book is... Two Toms. Learn to, <laughs> to, the, the, the tale of two Toms. Uh, the, the, the book. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's true. Very true. That's, exactly. Uh, and I love his sense of humor. The book is Learn to Love, Guide to Healing Your Disappointing Love Life. So much we just heard. Uh, there's teaching moments here. I just want to play it back. Uh, you just heard Tom talk to us about a psychological, our psychological love life, a bit of a blueprint that we have. And when I read Tom's book, you know, you it really, you get a chance to take a look at what, what are you carrying with you? I like to say, why do you do what you do? And you know, Tom, I always like to joke about this because I'm a, a corporate trainer in my company. I go out and teach uh, business leaders. I do workshops, and I'll usually say, you know, when uh, when the relationship goes bad and people are sitting around the the bar or the coffee shop having a drink, what do you usually hear? What do you usually hear the person saying? And they're you, the fingers usually pointing that way. Uh huh. You know, she, right. She was. Right. She was this. He was. And, and what we've heard. <laughs> totally. And right. what we've heard. What we've heard you say today is, you know, you have. Have a blueprint that guides you that cr- creates a why you do what you do in love life and other relationships most people don't take the time to learn what that is and i recommend through some of the work that you're doing that that people find that out and, and then work with uh, uh, someone like a Dr. Thomas Jordan to walk with you, because I don't believe that people can do it on their own. I want to ask you another quick question if you want to riff on what i just said the question is about um, you know how discovering a healthy love life after so many relationships have gone bad you know how do how do we do that now that we know the blueprint that maybe there's some rules we carry with us how do we unravel that and do we go find somebody else or do or can we resolve our relationship if the person you were with maybe hasn't done that kind of work yeah, I think I think uh, a lot of people unfortunately jump into another relationship. That's known as the rebound, um, yeah. and I don't think that's particularly healthy because chances are you'll carry the same psychological baggage from the previous relationship into the new one. Um, I always tell people that a little time spent looking inward is very valuable. Um, figuring out what's in the psychological love life, so to speak, to understand uh, what can be changed, um, what was learned, what can be unlearned. But so that first step, it's a three-step process in my mind, and this is what I talk about in the book, to try to make it a guidebook so that people can use it to think about and begin the process of change. Uh, The first step is always to identify what's in your psychological love life. And a clue to doing that is to look for repetitive patterns that may be occurring and to identify what relationship experiences might have gotten into your love life. For example, if you grew up in a home and you you were talking about home where abuse may have occurred, abandonment may have occurred. Um, if you see a pattern where there's uh, uh, finding partners who, who have difficulty making a commitment or finding partners who uh, repeat an abusive relationship over and over again, these, these are really strong clues that something was learned unconsciously and is being repetitive, repetitively replicated in one's love life. So that's the first step is to identify what are the relationship experiences that may have gotten into my love life and what did I learn from them? And the second step is, um, second step is to interfere with this process. And the wonderful thing about we human beings is we possess the ability to challenge something that may be unhealthy in our experiences. Uh, Once we become aware that uh, our psychological love life may have some learning in it that's unhealthy, we can interfere with that automatic replication that takes place. Um, um, It's sort of like challenging a part of ourselves that needs to be taken care of or needs to to unlearn something. And it's very possible to do that. The awareness that we have in many instances is an awareness of some part of ourselves that is not 
uh, working properly or is not producing the kind of results that we want. So being able to have that, what I think of as a therapeutic split between the part of us that knows there's a better way and the part of us that may be committed to something unhealthy. Uh, that's the second step. Um, uh, to become aware that we can't allow this replication to continue controlling our love lives. The third step is to uh, understand that practicing the opposite of what we've learned can be very important. For example, I have uh, um, seen many people over the years who uh, unfortunately had an abandonment early in life and as a consequence, a pattern of non-committal relationships, either because people cheat or because they can't make a commitment or they're not emotionally available for whatever reason, uh, that that gets replicated. So uh, being able to identify that and understand the opposite is to find someone who's emotionally available, someone who can make a commitment and to become sensitive to finding someone who practices that. So um, at, the th at the level of the third step, you're trying to shift your love life into a healthier and new direction. You're practicing the opposite of what, you've, what you learned in your life. In the case of abandonment, it would be the importance of making a commitment and being emotionally available in a love relationship. And you're looking for someone that practices that very thing in their life as well. Um, and an example that came up recently, can I tell you that? Uh, yeah, example absolutely. that came up recently, a patient was talking about, a patient with two children who was talking about getting back into her love life after a little hiatus, after leaving uh, the father of her children. So she was talking about, you know, a little scary, how do I tell who's a good partner and so on. Um, we, we, we came up with a hypothetical. Suppose uh, you had a date with a man who's a single father and he has two kids. Um, and you're sitting at a dinner table on a first date, exchanging experiences, and he's talking to you about being dedicated to his two kids and he's telling you about them. And you're dedicated to your two kids and you've told him about them. What's happening at your dinner table is two people who have commitment in their hearts, who practice commitment, are sitting with each other, thinking of the possibility of having a relationship when they've had trouble with commitment in the relationships prior. So uh, it's an example of a good thing. You know, it's an example of, uh, of finding someone who's as committed as you are. And that's, yeah. the, that's a nice new beginning for a love life. Uh, that's amazing. I just want to, there's a whole bunch of things. I'm going on a journey in my head here, Tom. Uh, a couple of things. I, uh, my dad, you know, some of the things we talked about my dad a lot. I love dad. Yeah, we, I miss him. But this, some of the things I saw as demons, his behaviors turned out to be, I call them gifts. I wrote about this in my book. But in some strange way, I can make a parallel to what you just said. I don't know if this makes any sense, that in some ways, I, if, when I look at the psychological profile of my life through the eyes of the relationships I had, seeing my parents' relationships, and that almost gave me a blueprint on what not to do, or gave me an awareness of there are some things there. So when I when I entered into my second marriage, I was very aware of some of those things that would trip me up, and I had work to do. I still do, but it gave me focus. It was almost gave me like a plan that you know. I experienced abandonment. I experienced abuse and control. Now that I understand that, you know, he, he, here's the things I'm going to bring into my next relationship. And exactly. and when I found when I found Anna, you know, I found someone just just to honor her. My wife's Italian, and the nucleus of the Italian family is the mother. And I mean, man, when I first met my wife, I walked up the back stairs of the Italian home where there was a table with ten of them. It sounded like fifty outside the room. There was a dummy john of wine and all sorts of pasta and they were talking and loving and cutting each other off and i learned through her what <laughs> what what having a family a loving family relationships might look like and so when she came into my life she brought certain things that i needed but there were also things mm -hmm. she experienced from a traditional controlling uh, upbringing where she was treated mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, took a beer identity. She wasn't allowed to be a girl. She wasn't allowed to date. Mm -hmm. So there were things she brought into my life that over time exposed themselves to me as, you know, th those are challenges. And so we've both been working on that. So it's pretty fascinating. Everybody, I want to finish with this on this, this little 
uh, part of mine. Uh, on page 50 or 21 in the book, it says the following 10 unhealthy relationship experiences were the most common. Abandonment, abuse, control, dependency, dishonesty, exploitation, mistrust, neglect, rejection, self-centeredness. You got to get Tom's book, everybody, because it breaks down each one of those. And I actually went through and I was able to highlight three that actually were part of my upbringing through my parents' relationship. And then he gives sort of like, I call them the antidotes of, okay, now what do you do? And how do you move forward in finding or in your relationship? Pretty amazing. Uh, one one question I want to ask you as we move to wrapping up soon, Tom, uh, and we'll give you the last word, is this is an awkward one for me because my wife doesn't mean it and people in my life don't mean it. But, you know, I'm, I've been a, come from a broken uh, childhood. So some would say I was emotionally somewhat broken and I've developed myself and learned. I see it a lot where people will throw in the uh, face of others their shame. In other words, somebody will read a book like this and then paraphrase it back to the person in a bad argument. Well, you know what, just because you're abandoned by your father, blah, blah, blah. Talk to us about that. Help us understand how to love the other person if you're married to somebody who comes to the awareness that they have maybe uh, a psychological profile that's somewhat dysfunctional. We, We don't use that against them. We, you know, I can't heal with that type of energy. Uh, my wife and I talk about that a lot and she's very supportive. Have you come across yeah. this or do you have any advice for people? Well, you're, you're again talking about defensiveness. When people do that, try to shame someone or try to use knowledge against someone, I think they're being defensive. I think their own vulnerability is at stake. That's where I go in my mind. Um, and if, uh, if your partner is doing that to you, you know, it would be, it would, I think it would be a good idea to think in terms of they're being defensive. Um, they're being defensive. They're, they're concealing their own vulnerability. Uh, let's face it. I mean, to make changes in your love life, there's a certain amount of humility and vulnerability that's required. You have to be open to looking inside yourself. Um, so things like using knowledge against your partner or being defensive, that's only that's only communicating that you're uncomfortable looking at yourself in the mirror enough to realize what it is you need to change. And I would remind that person that um, making changes in what we do in our lives as we grow older in particular, especially in middle age, is a wonderful opportunity. Um, It's a wonderful opportunity. And I think, and I try to push this idea in the book, I think learning has a lot to do with it. And there's a, the good news about that is that, you know, learning is our greatest asset. It's also our greatest liability. You know, you can learn stuff that's unhealthy and and problematic, and you can repeat it over and over again and not even know you've learned it. But um, the opportunity to learn something new and to unlearn what is unhealthy that's our greatest asset going forward. So thank you for that's, the opportunity having a forum to say that. <laughs> uh, well, well, thank thanks. you for, thank you for saying it. Everybody, a uh, teaching moment from Dr. Tom there. You got to come back and listen to this part of the show. And if you've been watching the live stream, one of the fun things, Tom, we have is we have people watching and able to comment. And we just mm-hmm. put up on the screen a comment from Linda uh, just as we were talking, she said, people connect on a wound. And then she said, spot on. Man, you got a fan out there. Now, I happen to know her. Know her. I interviewed her. And she has a an incredible story of her own coming from uh, an interesting relationship situation. I, uh, I'm so inspired, Tom, by you and your work. And uh, this particular book, I want to just share one more thing that I thought about. Uh, through my concussion, which you and I talked about offline, I'm recovering from a two-year brain injury, and I'm doing well, that I learned I was sent to CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, and I learned about neuroplasticity. And here's hope, everybody. As you're hearing Tom talk about, I've learned that the brain can uh, reteach itself to think, can change the Mm -hmm. meaning of thoughts. And so this is a gift because in Tom's book, he shows us how to identify our 
psychological profile, which I'm going to call, why do you do what you do in relationships? And then we can rewire, we can change uh, the way we behave, the way we think about relationships and what we do. It's amazing. So, uh, Tom, I'm so excited. We could talk forever. We'll have you back again. I want to get the last word before I honor you with a couple things on uh, how can we get a hold of that amazing book and where can we get a hold of you, sir? Uh, Amazon.com and other book distributors as well. Um, I also have a website, the Love Life Learning Center.com. It has a lot of nice articles about how to uh, have a healthy love life, keep a healthy love life going. Uh, you can also get the book through that website. Um, I opened the website back in 2012 as like an online library of articles that people could use to get the straight scoop about love life issues. So um, I have about 300 articles on there now. So, um, wow. and uh, I'm in New York City. I'm also open to love life consultations via phone. My wife and I, by the way, if anybody needs a little work, help uh, a little support as they go through changes in their love life, I'm open to that as well. My phone number is on the website. So is my wife's. Um, I want to say one thing, okay. if I can, you're an inspiration. <laughs> yeah, you, thank Tom you. Dutta, thank you for uh, I, 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 thank you for giving me the opportunity to meet you. Your your openness and your uh, honesty and openness about yourself is truly an inspiration. I want to say that absolutely. Thank you. Well, well, th thank you, Tom. All, all, all I can say to you with uh, with the heart is, I wish I was you, man. <laughs> and I, uh, uh, yeah. uh, no, you just I, stay you. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so on that uh, on that note, and I like your your sense of humor. That's uh, that's something I I've got in spades. Probably helped me get through a lot of things in my life. Absolutely, that, um, it's one of our better qualities, right? <laughs> that, absolutely. So I want to say this, everybody, that you've heard me talk about this before. That as a CEO myself and somebody who's worked in business for a long time and been married a couple times, we can't walk alone through chapters of our life. And whether you experience the loss of a loved one, a loss of a job maybe depression or or even a relationship gone bad, you need to reach out and find someone to walk with through that chapter. And so when Tom says reach out to me, I encourage everybody to reach out. I'm, I'm going to put in the show notes, lovelifelearningcenter.com, a, a huge amount of resources there. Uh, but even if it's for a consultation or a talk, no matter whether it's Tom or somebody else, everybody, you 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 can find... You can find uh, happiness on the other side of whatever it is you're dealing with. I promise you that. Absolutely. I've done it. I've done it in my own life, and Tom's helped thousands of people do it. Tom, I want to honor you with a few things. I do this on all my shows. You see my head turning, writing notes. Those listening couldn't see that. Uh, these are leadership words. They just come to me as you're speaking. First one is love. Your love. Number two is wisdom. There's a ton of wisdom in your mind from the work you've done. And what we've discovered is you're walking the talk. You're what I call the hero's journey. You, you experienced difficulty in your own uh, early life and did something with it to help others. Your vision, uh, you can see a future. I can see that in your book, a future of having happier people and loving relationships. And then the last one is mentor. This one's important to me. They say when you need to become something, you go find somebody who's done it. Well, everybody, Tom is a mentor in this category. And I'm going to now induct you into the Quiet Warrior Tribe. I bet you you didn't know I was going to do this to you. Thank We're you. going to give you an, you an award. When I started the show, Tom, I created an award. You can see behind me there the screensavers. Uh, 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 this is a challenge coin. They originated in World War II. I had these minted in the United States. Uh, they're hand-painted and, and uh, beautiful. The front is the image of the show. The back is actually Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey narrative, which is the theme of my show. It comes in a cherry sure. box, and uh, every year, less than 50 of these go out across the world to people like you who will check their ego at the door and show vulnerability. Is that a... Uh, a, uh, a celebration going on there uh, and uh, show vulnerability and come on and, and tell their story of what they're doing to help people in the world. By receiving this coin, Tom, you officially become a quiet warrior. We have them in about seven or eight countries now and know that you're connected to all of those people. You can find them through the archive of my show, but thank you for doing what you're doing, sir, and be thank happy you. to thank have you, you back on much. again. I'm honored. I'm honored. Thank you. You're welcome. 
All right. Well, everybody, we're going to wrap up this show. It's been a great one. Listen, it's going to be produced and released on the Quiet Warrior International podcast and also as a YouTube premiere video. This will come up in the future. You'll know about it. Please go to Tom Dutta YouTube channel or certainly find any of my social media feeds where you can find this taping as it sits now. Enjoy it and uh, find it and support it when we release it so we can honor Dr. Thomas Jordan's work. Tom, thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Be well. Thank you for listening to The Quiet Warrior Show. Create is a motive-based leadership development firm. www.create.ca 